Well, today's message is on Thanksgiving. Uh, show a little faith. Be thankful. Right away you can be thinking that maybe when we're not thankful, what is it? A lack of? Thank you. We just prayed that we'd all be fully engaged, and I'm so glad that God answered that prayer with Glenda. Now, for the rest of us, show a little faith, be thankful, because sometimes we can be so bent out of shape, we can be pouting, we can, we can miss out on life. We can miss out on God because we lack faith. We don't see things as we should. I'm, uh, I'm 45, and I've been blessed with wonderful friends since as long as I can remember. I, I come here, and I'm rejoicing. I look forward to this all year, and not just for the food. Not just for the food. I look forward to this all year because I get to be with you guys and you're my family. And I love this time. I've been blessed with wonderful friends since as long as I can remember. A great family, a wonderful extended family. God gave me my best friend, Yumi, to be my wife and then sent four children that make me feel rich every time I look at them. Uh, I've never been hungry except by choice when fasting. Never lacked food or clothing. Maybe not always had the food and clothing I wanted. Uh, I've been blessed with education, cars, books, computers, toys. And yet, sometimes I'm so concerned with what's going to happen next in my life. Have you ever been there? Worried about what's going to happen next that I forget to be thankful for what's already happened. And I can forget to be, enjoy the gift of the moment, the gift of the present. Have you ever been there? Living in the past or worrying about the future and not thankful for what God has with us right here, right now. Uh, I can't help but think that living in the past or in the future is a failure to appreciate and give thanks for the present. We, we, we need to choose to be thankful. Psalm 14.1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know what? I've heard that voice, I've heard that verse quoted before. Somebody said, even the Bible says there is no God. Uh, failing to uh, read what was in the first half of it. Uh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. I think they probably did a, a search, an online search, and saw there is no God, took that sentence without bothering to read it in context. I want to ask you, though, is it, enough just to believe in God. Well, right now, because we believe in grace, a lot of us are thinking, yeah, just believe in God. That's your ticket. You go to heaven. Well, the answer might surprise you. James 2.19 says, you believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe, and they shudder. You know, Satan knows that Jesus is God. The demons know Jesus died for our sins. All hell understands that God rules in heaven. So just saying, yeah, I believe there's a God, well, it's a good start. But you know what? The demons believe there's a God, and they shake in fear of him. So actually, they're a step ahead, because wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord, according to Scripture. But what's going on here? What's going on here? Because we just said it's not enough just to believe. But every single one of us, if we've been around church at all for any amount of time, period of time, we know that you're not saved by your good deeds, right? You can never be good enough to earn salvation. Heaven is a place for perfect people. Even if you could be perfect from today, that does nothing to make up for the past. And by the way, none of us are going to be perfect even today, not even, let alone from today. So what does it mean that belief is not enough but our good deeds can't earn us a place in heaven. Ephesians chapter 2, listen to this passage. As for you, he's talking to Christians. As for you, you were dead in your sins. It means before you became a Christian, you were spiritually dead. In which you used to live, the old way you used to live. So now that you're a Christian, there's supposed to be a new way to think, act, talk, everything. 
uh, in which you used to live, you followed the ways of the world. Means, what does that mean, follow the ways of the world? Anybody have an idea? That just means acting like everybody else. You see it on television, you hear it in music, your friends are doing it, so you do it, just like everybody else. Uh, used to live, you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is at work in those who are disobedient. We're talking about Satan. Satan is actually at work in those who are disobeying God. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. It means we just did whatever we felt like. And following its desires and thoughts, like the rest, just like the rest of the world that didn't know God, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Wrath is judgment. So the Bible puts this fire and brimstone in there for a reason. When we don't know God, we are by nature. What is our nature? We are an object for wrath. God's wrath is going to be poured out on that. But because of his great love, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. It is by grace you have been saved. It's by grace you have been saved not because of our works. For it is by grace you have been saved, this is Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. No one can boast. Nobody is going to stand before God and say, let me into heaven, look at me, I'm all that. Nobody is going to ride into heaven on a high horse. You get right with God on your knees. You get right with God when you say, I'm, a, I'm, I'm messed up. I've messed up in so many different ways. Lord, forgive. That's how we encounter grace. For, this is verse 10 now, for we are God's handiwork. God made us, created in Jesus Christ, for why? To do good works. Why that? You said good works can't save us. That's right. Good works can't ever get you to heaven. Grace gets you to heaven. Faith gets you to heaven. But why does God save us? So that we can do good works in his name. Good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has good things out there we're supposed to learn to do, to do all the things that God has for us. Loving, forgiving, patience, kindness, gentleness, courage. To be noble and good people. This is God's plan for us. And God prepared those things for us. So he, he saves us by his grace. He changes us. And now there's a new way to live. Romans 6, 23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, you have a job, you get paid a wage. Uh, your wage is what you get because you deserve it. You put in a, few, a certain amount of hours, you get a certain amount of uh, payment. That's, that's what you deserve because you work. Well, the wages of sin is death. Well, what's sin? Well, sin, technical definition, that which is opposed to the will of God. God says forgive, and you say, I ain't going to forgive. God says uh, don't, things that, don't take things that belong to you. And you say, well, they're not going to miss it anyways. Uh, God, God tells us to, to care about others and love other people, and we say, I've got to look out for number one. All of these things are sin. This, this evil, this darkness, this wickedness inside of us is so selfish and self-righteous. Nobody's going to tell me what to do, right? That part of our soul. Sin is the part of us that makes us to even hurt the people we love most. We say things, we do things that hurt ourselves and hurt those around us. That's sin. The Bible says that sin leads to death. So the wages of sin, like you have a job and you get money, you have sin, you get, the wage of sin is death. Now this is talking about death. Sin brings death in everything good. You think about hope, sin brings death to hope. You think about relationships and love, Sin will kill that. Selfishness is, is a love killer. Do you know that not one marriage has ever been broken apart from sin? You know, not one friendship has ever, has, has ever been broken apart from sin? Sin destroys. Sin is a killer. Sin will take your joy away. Sin will take your peace away. Everything good and, and beautiful in your life, sin will eat it up and destroy it. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the gift of God, 
is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. We have a God who doesn't give us what we deserve. People say, I want God to be fair with me. No, you don't. You do not want God to be fair. You don't want God to give you what you deserve. The wages of sin is death. And ultimately, we're talking about eternal death, which is separation from God in eternity, which is another word for separation from God in eternity is, what's the name of that place? Hell. Hell is eternal separation from God. God is everything good and wonderful. So you say, God, give me what I deserve. Well, nobody deserves heaven. Nobody, because that's for perfection. The wage of sin is death, but, but the free gift, some translations say free gift, the free gift of God is life, eternal life in Christ Jesus, our King. God gives us this because he loves us. God gives it to us. Now, if I were to say... Well, uh, we've the church has purchased a hundred Lamborghinis this morning. They're all waiting outside for you. Uh, you all, all you have to do is is uh, accept this key. Well, I'm guessing a lot of you would take a key. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. It's not enough just because the Lamborghini is available. You have to take that key. You have to go get it. You have to open it up. You got to sit down. You got to take it for a drive. Jesus Christ on the cross. Listen, everything you've ever done, every nasty thing you've ever said, all the things you wish you could forget about, all the things you hope nobody else saw, all the things that, that uh, you're just, you just weighed down because why did I treat people like this? Why did I do this? Every single one of those, Jesus Christ said, I'll take responsibility. I'm going to take all your garbage. I'm going to put it on me. He died taking responsibility for our sins. This is a historical reality. Jesus Christ died for your sins. And then, by the way, he rose again, proving that he can keep his promises. He said, I'm going to rise again. I can forgive you. I can give you eternal life. He wasn't just blowing hot air. But listen, you have to accept that gift. You have to take the keys. Jesus Christ died for your sins. Now come to him and accept this free gift. This gift of life, it changes everything. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The answer is, is also found a few chapters earlier in Romans chapter 1, 21. The passage is talking about people who for all practical purposes have rejected God. So, so on the one hand we say belief is not enough, but on the other hand we just saw you cannot earn your salvation. Well in Romans 1, 21 it tells us what's going on here. For although they knew God, these are people who know God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. They didn't give thanks to God. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were filled with darkness. You ever been there? Your heart's full of darkness, bitterness, anger, rage, holding on to a grudge. These are people that knew God. See, it's not enough just to believe. The demons believe. These people believe. But they did not honor him as God. And they didn't give him thanks. That verse could describe modern-day America pretty accurately, don't you think? Because... In America, almost everybody believes in God. On the surface, the U.S. is a very Christian nation. The vast majority of people, if you, if you walk up to somebody on the street and, uh, and say, will you check a box saying that Jesus is God, uh, he was born of a virgin, he died on the cross for our sins, he rose again, do you know that most Americans will check yes to each one of those? The, the, the studies have shown again and again, they've done re interviews again and again, Americans, yep, yep, believe that, believe that. They pass the test. Pass the test, I believe. Check, 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 check. And demons sitting right there and say, yeah, I know that. Boy, I hate that, but I know it. Yeah, he died for their sins. Oh, I hate that. They can go to heaven if they, yeah, I, I know, I hate that. He rose again. I wish we could have kept him down. Demons know all that. They're not going to heaven. And Romans 1.21 says it's possible to know God. 
but not honor him as God or give thanks. And our thinking becomes dark and hopeless and futile. People who check all the boxes pass the test. If heaven were a diploma you got for, for knowing theology, maybe that'd be okay. But what if heaven were a home? A home for God's family. Maybe checking boxes wouldn't be enough. What if, what if heaven were a place for those who love God? Check, 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 check. <laughs> done with this religious stuff now I can move on maybe that doesn't make you family we already saw you can't earn your way into heaven by good works or by correct answers the correct answers don't get you there passing a test doesn't get you there it takes love it takes trust but most of the same people that can check off all the answers go about their daily lives as if, as if God really wasn't much of a factor. And, and we, we technically might not be atheists, right? An atheist is somebody who's, who doesn't believe in God. Well, check, 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 check. Not technically an atheist, but more like an apatheist, like apathetic theist. We're apathetic to God's love. God loves you. Yeah, so? God cares about you. Yeah? So? Heaven is waiting for you. Yeah? So what? So what? And we don't live lives of gratitude. We don't live lives in appreciation for the cross. And you can tell that we really don't have faith in God. Because we don't trust that His ways are better than our ways. God says, here, here is the life that I want a Christian to live. And you say, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I think, I think I got it covered, God. I think I know what's best for me. God says, this is the way my people should live. Now listen, our behavior doesn't save us. But in what sense, can you explain to me, what sense do we believe in God if we don't believe his ways are better? In what sense do we believe in God if we don't think we need to repent? In what sense do we say we believe in God when we're saying, I'm going to live my life as I want, heck with God? Is that love? Heaven is a place for those who say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. You're so good. You're so wonderful. And I want to be close to you. So the question is, do you really want to be close or not? Today, after church, again, uh, we're celebrating our annual Harvest Day meal. We do that a few weeks before Thanksgiving so you can enjoy the feast properly twice. Uh, I look forward to Thanksgiving season each year. And yes, Lindsay, it is more than just great food. But it's even more than friends and family. And as I get older, I'm appreciating uh, the fact that in our country, we actually set aside this day culturally where we get to focus on being thankful. That's a good thing. Because sometimes we're so busy and we just keep going through life so quickly, it's good to take a, take a step back. Brothers and sisters, take a step back and say, I want to be more thankful. And when I am being pouty, I'm not being thankful. When, I, when all I can think about is what's going wrong, I'm not being thankful. When, I, when, I'm, when I'm unforgiving, I'm certainly not being thankful. How can I say, thank you for forgiving me and thank you for dying for me, Jesus, and I'm not going to forgive that person? Where is the heart of thanksgiving? I want my heart to be broken because I want to be more thankful. And I can be so, I can be so calloused. I can be so hard-headed. I can be so bitter. And all of it is foolishness. All of it is wickedness. Jesus, I don't want to be like that. So I look forward to Thanksgiving season because, once again, it's like Thanksgiving season, you know. When I was younger, I used to say Happy Turkey Day just to be funny. I don't even like that anymore. I, I'm not going to be upset if you say it. But I don't like it because the focus is supposed to be, to, we're running around, running around, stop, stop, just stop. Are you being thankful? Or are you 
have you found a comfort zone where you're ticked off and upset all the time at everybody and everything? Be thankful. So what does having an attitude of gratitude look like for a Christian? I decided to look up a bunch of verses, and I'm just going to go through some of these quickly and let the, let the Holy Spirit wash over us, let the Spirit of God, let the Scriptures speak to us. Colossians 2, 6-7. Therefore, talking again to Christians, therefore as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, you've received him as Lord, so walk in him. You got saved? Okay. Now walk with Jesus. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So what do we see here? Are we supposed to have just a little bit of thankfulness? No. It's supposed to overflow. When people look at us, they say, well, that's, that's a thankful person. That's a person who's not always complaining. A person who's always complaining is not a thankful person, right? Right? Come on, guys, it's simple, right? right? Right. So we want to have this attitude of gratitude. We want to be thankful people. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 through 18. See that no one, see that no one in the church, brothers and sisters, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another, to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, I think it's important it's not give thanks for everything. Uh, my car got blown up by purple aliens. Uh, thank you, God. Uh, you don't say thank you for everything. Uh, you know, uh, Sean just got tripped and he banged his knee on the, on the shirt couch. Thank you, God, for that. You, know, you, don't, you don't say thank you for everything, but you could say, Thank you, God, that I had a friend. Thank you that I had a couch. Uh, thank you, God, for the use of that car before the aliens came and blew it up. Uh, thank you. So you don't say thank you for everything, but you can say thank you in everything. Cancer, heart disease. You don't say thank you. I'm just so excited about cancer, Lord. No, but you say thank you, God that you've died for me and I have eternal life and no matter what happens in this world, I know I'm going to be with you. I know I'm going to be okay. Be thankful in all circumstances. For this, everybody sits around and says, I wonder what God's will is for me. What's God's will? Well, I've got good news for you. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will in Christ Jesus for you. Oh. So God wants me to th be thankful. Yes. Brothers and sisters, God wants you to be thankful people. Amen? Uh, Psalm 107, 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And listen to this beautiful praise that the prophet Isaiah wrote for the Israelites. Uh, Isaiah 12, 1 through 6. Then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. I like those. That's fighting words. This is where I'm standing. This is where I plant my flag. I'm going to give thanks to God. For although you were angry with me, your anger turned away, Lord, and you comforted me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. In that day, you will say, Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. Let it, this be known throughout the earth, cry aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Cry aloud, shout for joy, let everybody know. So part of being thankful is saying to the person who was out in the restroom or downstairs, they got Lamborghinis outside. Go get a key. Part of being thankful is saying, knowing Jesus is the most wonderful thing that could ever happen to me. This is the biggest thing that has ever happened in my life. You got to know Jesus too. Part of being thankful is saying, thank you, Jesus. And I got to get other people. Jesus died for the whole world and we keep it a secret to ourselves. How is that being thankful? 
Jesus died because he loves everybody. He wants us to love people enough to invite them into this family, okay? And that's part of living a thankful life. So part of being thankful is telling others how wonderful God is. Psalm 30, 11 and 12. You have turned my weeping, God, into dancing. You like that visual? God, you have turned my weeping into dancing. You have loosened my sackcloth. In the old days when you're, when you're really sad, you'd put on just this like burlap sack. I mean, it'd just be, and girded me with gladness that my soul may sing praise to you and be silent. O oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So this is idea of thankfulness is it's not just once a year. It's ongoing. I'm thankful. I'm a thankful person. You know, a bitter person cannot be happy. So if you want to be bitter, you ain't going to be happy. You know, a person holding on to grudges never enjoys life. A person who, who is always being critical is, is a person who's not going to be basking in the grace of God because a lot of times the reason we're critical is we haven't accepted God's grace for ourselves. We're not enjoying God's grace because if we were, why would we turn around and be so hard on other people? Brothers and sisters, there's a better way. And, and I don't know it. I mean, I, I know it, but I don't always live it. I want to be a thankful person. I want to say thank you, God, for, for Moses. Thank you, God, for Paul. And thank you, God, for Steve and for Norman and, and, and Elsa. I just want to look around and say thank you, God, for everyone I see. Thank you, God, for our church. Thank you, God, that we could sing praises to you this morning. Thank you, God, for this Bible. Thank you, God, for everything you put in my life. Thank you, God, that you are Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you, God, that you don't divorce, you don't leave your children behind. I want to be that kind of person. But it's a journey, right? Haven't arrived, but let's at least, brothers and sisters, let's at least be shooting at the right target. Over there is thankfulness. Over here is bitterness. Okay, I'm not as thankful as I should be, but maybe I shouldn't be shooting in the wrong direction. My life is going the wrong direction. I'm filled up with bitterness, anger, rage, all these things. Okay, God, well, I'm not a good shot, but at least you got me looking at the right target now. By the way, when we're shooting at thankfulness, we're less likely to put an arrow through somebody we love. And finally, Colossians 3, 15 through 17, where God drives it home three times in three verses that we need to choose to live thankful lives. Listen to this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let it happen. Don't fight it. Don't fight God's peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, all Christians everywhere, one family. And be thankful. Let me read that again. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, correcting one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then here's the key. And whatever you do, in word, whatever you do in deed, do to God the Father uh, everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So thankfulness in everything. Thankfulness in the way we talk. Uh, the way we use language should express our thankfulness. The way we treat other people should express our thankfulness. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Brothers and sisters, I want to I wanna show a little bit more th thanks. I want to show a little thanks I want to show a little faith in my life. Too often, too often, we miss out on the joy of Christ. We miss out on the peace of God. We miss out on hope, goodness, everything beautiful and wonderful because we're fixated on the darkness. God says, I have a better life for you. Show it a little faith. Be thankful. It takes faith.
Well, we have a choir practice. I'm thankful, very thankful for choir. I love it. Uh, we've got uh, people who can go out and rake leaves soon, and we need that. We can thank God for the beautiful trees around our church. And we have got folks that need to go downstairs and get that food ready, and I am very thankful for that food. It is not an exaggeration to say I look forward to that food all year long. So I want us to pray right now, and I'm going to give us a little bit of quiet time. So and in your heart, you can think, let the Holy Spirit work and say, God, I want to be more thankful. Let's, let's take some time right now to ask God to help us to be a little more grateful. Let's pray. Yes, yes, Lord, I want to, I see your life and it's so good. And every time I grab a hold of the reins and try to go my own direction, it, it always ends poorly. Teach me, Lord, and help me to be a good student. I want to be thankful, Lord. I want to be, I want to live a life of gratitude. I want to live my life in appreciation to you, Lord, daily. Father, help us to, to really value and encourage and lift up our fellow believers. Help us to, to share your goodness and your cross with a lost and dying world, Lord. Father, in everything, whatever we do, in word or in deed, Lord, we want to demonstrate faith by being more thankful. God, thank you for this day, this time to get together. Thank you for this church even the squeaky floors. Thank you for the people that fill the church, Lord, and, and the children and, and the people of all different ages and situations in life, Lord. It's so good to be so diverse and yet come together and be one family. Lord God, we come before you and we ask your blessing. Please bless us. Please bless our fellowship today. Please bless that meal that's cooking downstairs. Pray all this in your name, Father. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.